today we are in conversation with a very interesting leader, uh, Vishak. Uh, Vishak is the CEO of Madhura Lifestyles. Uh, there is no shopping center in India or big high street which you visit and you'll not find the Madhura Group's presence with their fashion parade of brands. Uh, great uh, to catch up with you, Vishak. Uh, very, I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting conversation. Thank you, Pankaj. Uh, pleasure being here. Yeah. Our session yeah. partner today is Ilan Group. Today is one of the finest boutique real estate developers in the country. The group is committed to setting new benchmarks of excellence in the commercial real estate segment. The group's bespoke offerings are constantly redefining customer experiences with innovative and cutting edge design and architecture, best in class amenities and conveniences. Since its inception, the group has stood for building the future and looks forward to contributing to the growth of the real estate sector through ultra luxury and cost effective retail, commercial and hospitality projects. Uh, can we have the video of the Ilan group, please? running the fashion lifestyle business? Uh, okay, uh, 26, 26 years uh, in this group. I joined as a management trainee in 1995. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and you, I see you run the uh, FMC, uh, the food business as well, which yeah. is the supermarket yeah. the, business. The ABRL, the more supermarket and hypermarket business. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. 2010 to 2016, I was with that part of the business. Uh, yeah, so it's been an exciting journey with the group, 26 years, primarily, as you can see, in brands and retail. Right. So how different is the fashion lifestyle business consumer from a, a food and, uh, you know, the FMCG regular staples customer who walks into a supermarket? Uh, is the customer thinking alike or he's a very different set of customer who's walking into those two places? Look, there are things which are, I guess, uh, common between the two. For instance, freshness. Uh, is something which is very important in both the businesses. Uh, newness, freshness, and so on matters a lot. Uh, I guess uh, winning the consumer's trust, confidence, uh, again, uh, very, very critical in both the businesses. Uh, people rely on their favorite brands to deliver again and again for that. Uh, the part which changes significantly is the uh, in the, in the food and grocery business, the SKUs are quite, quite well set. They don't change. So a certain glucose biscuit pack, uh, 400 grams, would not change over 20, 30, 40 years. For us, every style, every new design is, is a new SKU. And to that extent, that creates a lot of uh, challenges in the business. It, it, it creates SKU complexity on one hand, but it is what makes our business unique. And that's what makes it fun. Of course, it's also both, you know, in, in a sense, are part of the trinity of roti kapra or makar. Okay, so uh, so I've done the uh, the roti part and the kapra part now. Uh, of course, we have makan in our group with the cement business. Uh, so yeah, uh, it is uh, something which is very in, important. People talk about both uh, their food and grocery uh, and 
their apparel business in their conversations. So it is an interesting part of, you know, even before uh, we, we went live, you and I were talking about your dress and your, uh, your suit and all of that. So it is part of conversation. People enjoy talking about their clothes. They, they feel good when they uh, wear good clothes and so on. So yeah, so there are a lot of similarities as well. But uh, tell me, uh, in India, from a from a uh, consumer business, which is more, uh, you know, typically your staples, which is your grocery detailing and which is your supermarket business, uh, is dominated, which is has both your local competition of local grocers as well. Uh, but, but the primary product, which is the FMCG, large products are today now manufactured by large scale companies, whether they're global brands or Indian homegrown brands. Uh, but in the fashion business, uh, there are still very few uh, national level or large global chains which are there, which are organized. Is there a competition there also from the local market or the local market there is uh, inse getting to be insignificant in the fashion business at every price point? Because we, we've seen that at every price point there are now today in national level chains available where a customer can go and shop, right? Uh, I mean, from a shoe category, if you can look at it, there is a Bata and a Liberty as well, and there's an Idas and a Reebok and a Nike as well, and there's a, there, is, uh, there are shoes by, you know, I mean, Ferragamo is also available. So, you know, that spectrum of the market is getting organized, but is the fashion segment uh, also getting a lot more organized now? Is that, uh, or is there still the large market is still the unorganized sector? Okay, uh, you know, I think some of these are definitions that we create uh, uh, based on some guardrails, but at some level, all business is getting more organized. Okay, all business is getting more structured, organized. I have met entrepreneurs who run single store businesses who have a, a small label and they are extremely organized. Okay, uh, so I think there is an opportunity for various types of players. Okay, there are lots of local regional niches which are available, which are extremely well catered to by local entrepreneurs and uh, uh, more power to them. There is of course, uh, business models of large brands like us, which are able to cut through different uh, geographies, uh, form, retail formats and so on. And there is an opportunity there and we've been growing quite steadily in that. So my sense is Pankaj that uh, uh, it's, a, it's a large, uh, uh, frankly, even in the food and grocery business, there are lots and lots and lots of local entrepreneurs and so on. So even there, the so-called well-known brand penetration or organized sector penetration is is, is limited okay uh, so in, in each industry I, I think that's the beauty of this country there is opportunity for various types of business models and formats yeah so uh, in our business we do see uh, the impact of uh, technology the impact of uh, computer systems uh, digital uh, significantly helping people to get more organized as well. Okay, so today uh, you can see a single store boutique also advertising online and providing uh, uh, direct delivery to home from their websites and so on. So there is a, there is a lot of change in things uh, the way they are done. But, but you know, we've seen that uh, somehow the success story of international brands in India is still very, very limited or I would say still very small. Uh, compared to whether it's uh, homegrown businesses or brands which uh, organizations like business houses like yourselves have established, uh, which have far bigger success stories uh, in India. Why is that the Indian international brands still not been able to, or are still scraping the surface of the Indian market? Is it that they're not able to understand the Indian market or is it the guiding principles internationally mm -hmm. want to treat India as another in international market of theirs? What's, 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 the what's the opportunity and what's the challenge? So, so Pankaj, I think the answer is in your question. Uh, there is no one Indian market. Okay. There are probably 200, 300, 500 Indian markets. Uh, almost every 100 kilometers, the, the tastes change, the, uh, the preferences of consumers change. Uh, across the country, there are different uh, season impacts, festival impacts, uh, people get married at different times of the year, uh, their customs are different. So I don't think uh, you can paint India in one brush. Okay. Uh, one of the strengths that we've been able to build over a period of time is to understand the nuances of the length and breadth of this country. So it is, uh, you know, you go to UP uh, versus you go to Tamil Nadu, you could 
you could be in very, very different, you know, uh, consumer choices and preferences. There are markets where in a, in a, in a small town, this side of the road and that side of the road has very different consumer tastes. Okay. Uh, so I think it is very important that any organization which wants to do well, uh, 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 recognizes that there's no one India as a coherent, homogeneous uh, customer base. So recognizing that is the first step. Addressing the multiple supply chain needs of those many Indias is the next step. Uh, creating communication which is able to connect, creating product solutions which is able to connect and so on. So all of these require, uh, uh, I would say, deep capabilities, uh, which I guess uh, it just means that anybody who comes in will have to go through that uh, uh, process to be able to understand this country better. So I know you guys have been, uh, you've been running this business and the uh, organization and the uh, business house has been invested for a long time in retail and, you know, has a couple of many years of experience now behind it. And obviously the group experience is there. But tell me, uh, we, you know, you mentioned in the previous uh, question, mentioned about that there is an opportunity for us, uh, individual retailer, uh, he's also innovating. Uh, but how does he, you know, earlier it was that the owner or the father or the son used to typically sit on the, uh, on the, you know, in, in the store itself. And this, it was a lot more about the salesman driven. And they used to get the gut feel on the sales, on what the customer preferences is on the store level itself. Uh, but today, probably technology is changing and helping in that. But how does that individual or a smaller business house who's got smaller number of stores or a limited number of stores, uh, able to gauge customer preferences, how, how, how do they do it? Is, is technology available today at a, a economical price for them to invest in? Is it technology or is still the gut feel of in, end up, you know, business ma managers like you who also go out on the street and get that gut feel on the ground? What does it take to get to understand the customer there? So one of uh, the important pillars in our business model is the role of local entrepreneurial franchises. So a lot of our business is managed in the front end by franchisees who are, of course, extremely entrepreneurial, uh, very, very committed, understand the pulse of that town, of that market that they operate in, have very strong relationships with consumers uh, in that market. And as a consequence, are also able to relate to us uh, what is it that their store needs. Okay, now this is something which requires an entire organizational DNA to be able to manage this, to be able to take on feedback like this, work on it, respond to it and so on. So I guess uh, there is a lot that can be done by just being there. You know, the, the franchisee who's there in these local markets, the, the local entrepreneur who's there, uh, while technology can be a force multiplier, okay, it does help to uh, 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 organize yourself. You could have a CRM program which helps you to connect better to consumers and so on. But at a fundamental level, there is a huge power in, um, in, in relationships in the market. And uh, so you, when you look at the power of franchise, which is the entrepreneurial spirit, and in India, I think, if, like, you know, we say, we used to always say that we're in a country of traders and shopkeepers. You know, that was always, and farmers. And, you know, because that's where the three big pillars of this country were always uh, initial years was. So do you let the business, these franchisees able to give you, have a feedback mechanism which reaches out to you as a management team uh, in terms of what the local preferences are, uh, buying patterns are, or all designing the, the future collections are? Bunker, so you have all a, the time, all the time. I think there are two forces which are at parallel play. At one level, uh, we create international fashion, uh, we, understand trends, uh, look at predictive trends and so on, and put that together. Another level, there is a, a, a feedback mechanism from the stores, from franchisees, from store staff, all of that, which is, uh, uh, which is compiled together. And, and then the two meet. Okay. So there is, there is a constant level of interaction, which is happening all the time. I mean, this is, uh, this is an everyday process in the organization. Absolutely. And so tell me, Vishak, uh, you know, as a brand, uh, you have a power of, so brands like Louis Philip, Anand Solly, Vanusen, who really become, you know, 
uh, marquee brands in themselves in India. Uh, and, and you know, when the journey started, it was very small brands, and everybody used to perceive that they are, you know, uh, they are international brands, but they were actually, what I understand, they're all essentially homegrown brands which your uh, business house created, right? No, these are, uh, uh, each of these brands has its own uh, history. So, for example, Van Heusen is amongst the world's largest shirt makers. Right. Okay. So, Van Heusen is a different uh, uh, context. Uh, some of these brands were extremely strong in Europe a uh, few decades back. Okay. And we were able to get the permanent licenses for these brands. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, these are uh, largely uh, European anchor brands. Having said that, the fact that uh, we can create locally, we can create in India, uh, helps us significantly to uh, understand consumer needs of each market well, and uh, we are able to cater to it. So uh, when we create, it's extremely important that what we produce for our customers is uh, world-class in everything that we do, in quality, in trends, in fashion, and so on. But we created with the ability to move with speed for uh, local tastes, for, uh, for meeting uh, various uh, usage occasions that consumers have. So in that sense, uh, it's, it gives you the best of both worlds, okay? which is that it gives you the ability to access uh, global trends. Of course, we also are fairly global in our sourcing uh, of products. Uh, each product comes from where it can be best sourced from. So all of these give you a uh, give you an ability to put together for your consumer a, a much better what what the consumer needs. Right. You know, uh, recently you have done uh, uh, very strategic acquisitions of Indian fashion players. Uh, I remember talking to one very large global fashion house a couple of years back, and I was asking their India strategy. Um, and this gentleman was from uh, I think from the uh, obviously from the. Uh, not representing the board, but some senior management from the Milan uh, uh, fashion house. And he says, you know, in India, we would love to see an Indian homegrown brand, uh, a fashion designer becoming a brand globally. Uh, if you look at what I understand, my uh, limited understanding of fashion is that most of the big fashion houses, which are there globally as well, these are actually individuals, designers who started once created these brands. And eventually they got connected to a conglomerate, whether acquired, partnered, or the other, like whether it's Coco Chanel, or whether it's Tommy Hilfiger, or a couple of these, uh, I mean, whatever brands you look at it with the others. And then they became global brands, per se. From an individual design, designer-led business, they became global brands. And you have started recently acquiring uh, Indian brands and partnering with them. Do you think from India that it could be a story that today that is the is there thought process from an India story perspective or is a thought process that these could become iconic brand houses eventually global and they, we could have global brands which are from which are come from the Indian market? So uh, simple answer is yes. I think uh, there are two forces at play here. One is uh, are there people with capability here uh, which can be spread beyond Indian borders and become strong in other markets? Our simple answer is yes. The larger issue is also that India is also at a stage where per capita consumption is extremely low in apparel and is growing, is growing big time. It's a very, very large market opportunity. And to that extent, there is, uh, like I said, each Indian state is like a European country. Uh, you know, and that's the kind of uh, market opportunity which lies for anybody who is creating here. So I guess the answer to your question is yes on both fronts. There is lots and lots of opportunities to create here. And I think there are enough capable uh, business models, uh, uh, brands, brand names, which can be extended beyond the borders as well. So when you mentioned that India's uh, per capital is still very small and is growing exponentially. So what's the kind of numbers we're looking at right now in India growth story, in terms of growth story, in terms of uh, fashion region? Uh, okay, uh, look, COVID has changed a lot of yeah. things. And, yes. uh, you know, so there is a reset of sorts on some of these numbers. But I would say a double digit CAGR is, uh, is a very doable thing for, uh, for this country in terms of apparel uh, growth, okay? Uh, so, uh, yeah, 10, 11% kind of numbers is what uh, 
uh, uh, is is very doable for this country for quite some time to come because we are very very underpenetrated right now in terms of apparel consumption. And so, how many touch points does uh, uh, Aditya Billa re fashion retail have in India from from a customer standpoint? How many stores? How many touch points? See, it, it again. Uh, if you if you extend it right up to our innerwear distribution and so on, probably fifty thousand touch points. Wow. So uh, so yeah, so it would be uh, it would be fairly. Uh, but if you compare it again with uh, FMCG and so on, it's nothing. Right. Okay. It's still uh, it's still some way to go before you can reach that. So yeah, I guess that is why uh, I say that there is lots of opportunity in this country for for growth. And it's not just in Pankaj, not just in small towns. It's it's in big cities as well. In Mumbai and Bangalore also, there is lots and lots of opportunity for growth. It's still underpenetrated even in these markets. So there's there's opportunity everywhere. But uh, the, you know, everybody has been talking about the opportunity being there very large. Uh, but any large event which happens, for example, uh, let's take the online uh, e-commerce which comes into the country. Does that change? Would that change the way India shops, even in the smaller towns as well? Uh, because I know urban customer is still very. Uh, I mean, they may not be sure about, uh, but they understand the mediums very well. Uh, but is it changing in the tier two, three, four, Absolutely. more than tier Absolutely. three, tier four? Absolutely. Simple answer again. Yes, I think, uh, and and you have to look at it as a continuum. Uh, what percent of decisions are digitally aided versus what percentage of commerce happens digitally. So it's a it's a phase. I, I think in towns, a very significant part of decision making by consumers is digitally aided. So they will search online, they will check on, on various social media platforms and so on. They, they make up their own mind based on their digital information. Commerce also, I think it's increasingly growing. Okay, so there is uh, a lot of leapfrogging which is happening uh, in terms of uh, uh, lengthening back to this country. Internet penetration is fairly high. People are uh, people are able to real time get whatever is happening around the country. So uh, my own sense is that yes, uh, it is going to be a, a digitally enabled uh, growth journey. And the consumer behavior in a when because the India a lot of part of the country still resides and there is. Uh, I, I would say there's a lot of unexplored markets, which is there in tier three, four. Uh, and there is a decent amount of wealth which resides there because uh, one thing, the, the good thing is that those industries are still sometimes recession proof because uh, they're doing the regular day-to-day -day industry. They're not dominated by global uh, uh, factors. You know, they're de dependent, they're, they're doing the local businesses of consumption, whether it's manufacturing of industrial products or whether it's trading, whether it's, uh, you know, they may be, supplying to larger industries, but I'm just saying they're still more insulated uh, in tier three and four. We've seen that there is, they tend to be more resilient in any uh, unforeseen event which happens. They come tend to come back faster than a tier one and a tier two. So, but from a trend perspective, tier three and tier four, are they adopting fashion or they're still very uh, on the basics yet? Uh, so you do you see that the, uh, the no, will the no. uh, dhoti get changed to jeans uh, soon or is it there is still the older generation will still continue to follow the way they go to the tailor and get themselves stitched. On so the what retail is making a penetration there? On the contrary, uh, small town India is actually a lot more adventurous on fashion. Okay. And uh, there's, a, there's a reason for that. Uh, you're in a corporate hierarchy uh, sitting there in your Anarok office. In a jacket. Uh, in a jacket. Because you have a need to conform. Right? You have a, a, a disciplined structure, you have clients to meet and, you have, uh, and so on. When you go to small town India, uh, a lot of that need to conform is just not there. Okay, right. And to that extent, there is uh, a much greater amount of fashion independence, uh, much greater uh, individual expression of the kind of clothes. It's extremely fashionable. You know, we keep... Uh... Uh, seeing news items and I think all of us look at one blip of uh, news flash which comes on our notification on our phone when our, we think that the world has suddenly changed and we talk about look listen uh, uh, read about you know uh, international big brand uh, globally in the US or in the UK or in Europe suddenly shutting down their stores or talking about chapter 11 uh, 
and and we realize that is that a real is that a real story uh, is it just because one bank uh, files a big chapter 11 or restructure in their business for some reasons or the others is the market uh, in fashion getting consolidated globally or is that uh, is there a uh, is there a new set of brands or retailers emerging which we are not yet aware of not heard about it because uh, they've not yet come to the indian shores or they're not coming to more close proximity to us so pakaj i think i'm sure this is true in other industries as well but i can say this for the fashion industry uh fashion by definition means newness means change means continuous reinvention okay there are companies which do that well there are companies which don't i guess the ones which uh keep evolving are the ones which do well uh, survive and do well so yes so in every uh, part of the world there will be companies which don't keep up with the changing pace of consumers needs technology all of that and some who do, or and many who do so that's that's probably uh, uh, an explanation to to your question uh, my own sense is that uh, there is there is an inherent need to constantly keep changing constantly keep adapting to consumer requirements to changing uh, needs of for instance if if today i cannot show my product well digitally i will not reach a whole lot of consumers so in addition to all the things that i do i need to make sure that i am able to address the digital native well okay right. or let's say um, in the last 12 months a large part of consumers need was work from home clothes yeah if i have to do well i need to be the best in work from home right so when consumers think of work from home clothes they should still think of my brands first so com- probably comfort would come in more priority than at this uh, point of time trendy. at this point of time but now as soon as you go back to a uh, uh, a post covid world and you you having a, a large wedding and a gathering again you have to think of my brands when you think of what to wear for that wedding right okay uh, or when you go back to work and you need the the best wrinkle free shirt uh, that you can get again you have to buy that louis philippe on a press shirt so so i guess it's very important that brands are able to anticipate what consumers would need and within their brand guard rails provide that solution to consumers and uh you talked about how many you said 50000 um, how many st- uh, which how many would be exclusive stores for you in india exclusive stores across our brands maybe about 2500 odd stores so 2500 and, and today a lot about retailing is a lot about experience like you said you in digitally you have to present yourself well i mean yeah. the whole experience comes in when you look at it the picture looks nice the how it's presented on the screen whether it's a mobile or whether it's a tablet or a, or a, on a on a on a desktop or a laptop uh, even in a store is all about communicating with the customer it's not about selling a product with 2500 stores how you able to deliver that kind of experience down there down there i mean because you you talking about different language sets of people you, you talked about uh, you know the guys the road outside can be dug up because you don't know what can happen in i mean let's be honest we are in kind of country like india uh, but your store inside will always look good but how are you able to deliver that experience then uh, in these 2500 stores oh, okay okay now this is uh, this is what we do okay this is our business uh, first of all it's across brands across markets there are uh operations managers regional managers franchisees their entire ecosystem which works toward their customer feedback mechanisms there are net promoter scores there are so there is an entire uh, machinery which works towards delivering that and that's what i like you know that's what in any business uh delivers value to the consumer and hence value to the organization so yeah uh, you've got to deal with it you are you're absolutely right there are lots of uh, uh, nuances differences uh, uh, yeah you got to deal with it and uh, uh, find solutions you know much bigger challenges are around uh, uh, how this country changes uh, seasons how you've got to build for uh, uh, you know for instance weddings are an extreme seasonal business in this country right okay uh, you you don't get married uh, 
uh, in some months you get married in some other months and, and so on. There are good dates, not so good dates. So building a supply chain which prepares for that, building a supply chain which prepares for a huge winter business in three months and then completely out of it after that, building a supply chain for festival uh, supply chain. Yeah, so all of these is what makes the business exciting. And comparing it to an international brand, would you bring that to an India? Uh, how uh, easy or challenging it is to get to India and getting to them to adapt to Indian markets? Uh, you know, at, at, there is, you know, at, at a fundamental level, uh, a brand and a brand guardrail of what you should not change. Okay. Right. Uh, anywhere in the world, there is a certain expectation of how a brand is, is seen by consumers. In fact, that's what consumers buy into. There are other things like, let's say, a fit, okay, uh, which is extremely important that you are able to give to the consumers the fit that the consumer wants, the size sets that the consumers want, uh, the ability to adapt to uh, uh, local customs, festivals, and so on. And so I guess uh, there is a, a fine balance that you have to find of what do you not change and what do you adapt. The, the sort of people that we work with, uh, the brands, I think uh, they understand that fairly well. You know, and, and probably also because uh, of the relationship that we enjoy, there is a, a trust that they have in our, in our um, uh, understanding of this country as well. So yeah, so it's a it's a combination of what what do you not change and what do you adapt to local markets. So any learnings which you like to share from uh, not so success stories uh, from the people who want to hear from you? That they, I'm sure they will be. As I always say that you know if you get your decisions right on seventy percent, you are always there, right? Mm. Uh, there will always be thirty percent which will be experiments, some decisions which will not go as planned. But any good learnings which you can share with the group? Okay, let me try. See, uh, lots of mistakes on, let's say, locations, okay? So uh, I guess, uh, you know, it's a no-brainer that if you don't get the location right, all the effort that you take uh, doesn't help, okay? And, and mind you, it's not just locations at the time of opening the store. Locations also evolve, change over time. Uh, a flyover in front of your store can change your location, dynamics, something else can change and so on. So you, I guess that's one kind of mistakes that we've made in the past and uh, learned from them. Uh, lots of, uh, I guess, errors of judgment can happen around the uh, choice of merchandise, collections, stories. You know, you probably some stories are way ahead of time, uh, don't work, and so on. So that's another kind of mistakes, I guess, uh, uh, we've made. But but there are methods by which you deal with it and and uh, and rotate your merchandise become fresh again. Uh, I've caught me by surprise, so I'll I'll have to. Uh, no, no. I just wanted to know what comes in your mind because you mm -hmm. know it's just uh, as a leadership, uh, 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 you know, I'm sure at, there are lots of challenges which will be coming to your table. Mm -hmm. uh, some smaller you, challenges every I, day, I, but some I, are larger challenges as well. At a, at a very basic uh, Pankaj uh, level. Uh, Whenever you try to change basic habits of consumers is where the effort required is the highest. Right. Okay. Uh, I'll give you an example. So when COVID happened, mm. okay, uh, we, we figured very quickly that this country needs protective gear like masks. Right. Okay. And uh, we did a damn good job of making masks. Even today, I can show you our masks are absolutely best in class. I mean, they're really protective and comfortable and, and they look good as well. So, uh, so we made that and uh, some we donated. So of course, we also sold masks on websites and stores and so on. Uh, we thought we could extend protective gear beyond uh, some of those products. For instance, we made a travel gear, which was like a protective travel gear. It bombed. Okay. So, you know, where you try and create a new look, which consumers were not used to, it requires a huge amount of uh, uh, effort to change habits. 
So yeah. And so is an Indian customer anyways a little more difficult? Uh, he's more demanding. I, oh yeah. So we've uh, we've dealt with. Uh, I I don't think so. I don't think the Indian consumers any any more difficult to please or easier to please or something. I think yeah. that and, and also there is no such thing as an Indian consumer. It's 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 a Bangalore. Because anyways, uh, uh, you have to be trained, mindset trained to motivate to yeah, buy I mean, a product and, and create demand for your consumers are reasonable people. They expect good value. They expect good service. They expect uh, uh, you know uh, consistency from you in in what you deliver. So yeah, I, I think that's that's not uh, the point I was making was around habit changing. Whenever you try to change consumer habits, uh, what they you know uh, what they think is hard. This is a good look. When you are changing that, that requires a lot of. So it's, uh, yeah, and yet every once in a while you got to do that, because right. uh, uh, consumers also expect that from you. They also expect newness from you. Yeah, and I think uh, also the power of an have a, a consumer who's who's typically uh, like I would say you know beyond a point we cannot visualize. If you're not from the business, right? As a consumer, I cannot visualize. But if somebody who's from the business knows what's the next fashion, big fashion trend is going to be. You can utilize it better. So a consumer will have to be, I would say, slowly mindset-wise changed. Like you know, yeah. I, I, like Kellogg's had to uh, change the way we eat breakfast from uh, idlis and parathas to uh, conflicts. I mean, they kept hammering at it, and I think a lot of part of India has adopted that. Uh, you know, uh, the fact of the matter. So it's, I know exactly what you're saying. There is that it is that you have to kind of continue to be invested in that uh, if you believe in it, right? So Vishak, uh, now a little, little bit about yourself as an individual. Uh, apart from work, what do you, how do you spend your time and what do you do? Okay, uh, uh, lots of sport. Yeah. Uh, lots of sport, uh, tennis, squash, badminton, depending on the partner I get. So lots of sport. Um, friends. Uh, friends and colleagues, I think now our works worlds are so intertwined that you know, very hard to find distinction between friends and colleagues. Uh, so yeah, so lots of colleagues uh, who we hang out with together and so on. So that's that's that. Uh, yeah, reading, uh, enjoy reading, all kinds of reading. Uh, so yeah, I mean uh, that that's that's what it is. Since you mentioned sports and you look to be an ardent uh, sportsman because you, if you're playing tennis and squash and the others and you, uh, presume you must be Djokovic, Djokovic yeah. winning the finals. Yes. <laughs> Is that the question you were heading for? No, 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 no. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I don't want to get preferences of individual, but I'm just saying, do you drive uh, when you drive, uh, uh, when you, 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 you're able to drive any uh, learnings or not learnings, I would say uh, some things which while you're playing a sport and take it to your work table as well. There's some things which you pick up from sport to your think, uh, work table as well perseverance is one clearly perseverance is one where you know uh, uh, you got to keep at it you know you might be down 2 5 in the final set and you still hang in there uh, hoping that your opponent will make mistakes get tired or whatever so that's clearly one uh, i would also say uh, ability to bounce back okay uh, because in sport you do lose Okay, you're not going to win every game. You do lose, and uh, that also helps you to uh, uh, keep things in perspective. That it's okay to lose sometimes. It's okay to lose and uh, and then bounce back well, and so on. So that's the other thing. I guess sport also has some amazing analogies around uh, working together. Teamwork, you know, teamwork, passing the ball, uh, covering for your partner. Yeah, so some of these things <clears throat> happen almost automatically in sport. Right. So I guess, yeah, so that that's an analogy which you could uh, extend. Uh, it, it does help you to uh, work together, uh, you know, uh, build on each other's strengths. Not everybody is going to be able to do everything. Uh, so you, you deal with that in sport fairly well. And I, 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 I am whatever I uh, sport which I played and uh, what I realized two things which I take away always from a sport is uh, the spirit of winning, celebrating, uh, also. Oh, yes. I think, oh, yes. And oh. also uh, understanding why you lost. And when you lose something, you go and go back on the drawing board and, and saying, why did you lose or you could do better? Uh, probably gets back to the work table and give us some little more anecdotes in our work. Oh, yeah. Life. I think the, the nasha of winning, the high of winning, winning. is, of yeah, course, uh, is very much there. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
Pleasure talking to you, Vishak. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it really enjoyed to understand from you as a business leader who's a fashion, uh, really the moving the fashion needle in the country. Uh, understanding from you what you see as the markets uh, and the opportunity in India. And you rightly said, uh, we still have a long way to go. There is a huge, huge opportunity in India. Uh, listening, heartening to listen that we're going to grow at double digit and fashion for many more years to come. So lots of business opportunities for people like us as well. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, our session partners, Ilan Group and Mapic India for putting this together. Uh, and to let you know that we're having a next session coming up very soon. So keep a watch out for that. Thank you very much.